many people participated in the um, in the challenge or not. I don't know if we can maybe have a show of hands and um, maybe people could indicate if they did the challenge and sort of collected these clues or not. Are we able to do that, Simon and Chantel? Uh, we should have in uh, reactions on the thing, a raise hand. Yeah, so maybe people if, want to raise their yeah, hands can... if they participated. Oh, okay, or the chat will work. I know so, I saw Margaret O'Dell and Margaret. Um, yeah. Yeah, Margaret participated, so I recognize. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. About nine, I see right now with raised hands. Oh, it's difficult to count. It's nine. Okay. And one thumbs up, two thumbs up, and one, one right. sort of Apple thing. So yeah, okay, 11 good. so far, yes. Good. So we have uh, some of the people that are in yeah. the audience that participated in the challenge, and I sort of encourage um, everyone to do that. It's a lot of fun. Um, the clues change every year. This it, this year was my second year in doing it, and you know, hiking in that park is just such a joy. Um, anyway, so these are all the, the clues that you collected for this year. Um, Oh my goodness, I just had a funny window open here, which hopefully you're not seeing. This is strange. Okay, um, so the ones that you um, probably saw were uh, bear's head tooth, black trumpet. These are the bluets, chicken of the woods, um, your coral tooth, um, which is also sometimes called uh, hound's tooth or bear's head. Uh, this is giant puffball. I think most people know that one. This was your lumpy bracket, your oyster, scaly foliota, um, the spindle-shaped coral, and corals come in all sorts of colors and shapes, so that's a really pretty one. Turkey tail and scarlet hood. Um, I just want to sort of, before we get into the meat and bones of this lecture, just to let people know I'm not a mycologist, so I'm not an expert. This is just my hobby, um, so you just want to take everything with a grain of salt. And I also want to point out that um, I do forage as a hobby as well, but um, it's illegal to do it in, in provincial parks. So I did not forage in Frontenac Park, obviously. And it's illegal to um, forage in conservation areas. And that's not just mushrooms, that's just plants. And I think it's self-explanatory um, why that's the case. And it's also illegal and rude to forage on private property. And that, that's become a, a big problem, especially since COVID. So, um, I think if we do if we do things like that, we want to do it respectfully. So the things we're going to talk about in today's presentation, um, we're going to talk about mushroom anatomy. It's really important to know the parts of the mushroom if you're going to identify them. We're going to give a few tips on photographing mushrooms because uh, that's always something that's a lot of fun to do. Uh, we're going to talk about mushroom families, sort of group them and break them down. It's a little easier to learn that way. I'll give you some examples from some of these families. That, um, that you might commonly see when you're out for walks in the woods. We're gonna talk quite a bit about poisonous mushrooms because I think it's really important to know those first. There's really a small handful of ones that will kill you dead. So it's not onerous to memorize those ones. And then we'll very briefly talk about um, edible mushrooms but that's not really my focus of this presentation. Okay, so when we're talking about mushroom anatomy, the parts of the mushroom, and if you sort of think of the mushrooms you buy in a grocery store, those are the classical ones. Um, so we have a cap, um, the scientific name for that is pileus, and then there's the edge of the cap, so they can vary quite a bit. And then there's the part that produces the spores, um, classically gills, but they can have teeth and they can have little holes and a variety of different structures. Some mushrooms, but not all mushrooms, have a ring. It's also called an annulus or a skirt. So I sort of put this little mnemonic here just for fun. Um, not all mushrooms have a stalk, but um, many of them do. And some of them will have a bulb. And that's a really important thing to be aware of, especially with some of the really poisonous ones. And we'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, they can grow from this, this cup. Some mushrooms have a tap root, and then there's also um, mycelial threads. And the mycelium is kind of like the, the roots, and it's the tree of the mushroom. So when you think when you pick a mushroom, you're really just um, not you're gonna doing that in the park, but in other places, if you do pick a mushroom, it's like picking an apple from a tree. The tree is all underground, and that's what the mushroom comes up from every year. And then the fruit 
is the mushroom that you see or the structure that's um, above the ground. And just like when you pick an apple from a tree, you don't kill it. You're not gonna kill a mushroom um, if you pick the mushroom because the majority of it is all underground and that's what makes it pop up every year for most of them. So now um, when we're identifying mushrooms, we wanna pay attention to a lot of clues and it's kind of very similar that if you're a bird watcher, you know, you don't wanna just say, oh, there's a yellow bird. There's a lot of things about the yellow bird that you wanna take note of. So the same with mushrooms. Um, starting with the cap, you want to look at the color of the cap, obviously, um, the shape, because some of them may be like a cone and some of them may be more a classical shape like this, or some of them may be brain-like, such as morels. And then even the texture of the cap, you know, is it really slimy or is it shiny and waxy, or maybe it has little freckles on the top, sometimes called scales. Um, you're going to want to look to see if there's a ring or a skirt. Not all mushrooms have them, but if they do, that's a really important clue. And then you wanna look at the stem, you know, is it the same shape up and down or does it get really fat at the bottom or does it become like really skinny at the bottom? And the color, some of them are all one color. Some of them have a variety of colors. Some of them have little spots on them. So those are things you wanna look at. And then when you're looking under the cap, you wanna see, do they have gills? or maybe they have little holes in them called pores, or some of them might even have teeth. There's a type of mushroom called a hedgehog mushroom that has little teeth that kind of look like a hedgehog. And then finally, um, if you're really keen, you can make a spore print, and that's with mushrooms that you pick in areas where you're allowed to pick. So again, we're not gonna do that in a provincial park. But anyway, if you wanna know how to make a spore print, what you do is you take your mushroom and you cut most of the stem off, and then you put it on, uh, a piece of paper or you can put it on aluminum foil and then you look to see if the spore print is white or black or brown or cream or pink and that's a clue and then you can go to your mushroom books and um, and just sort of put all those clues together and that's how we come up with an identification. Not as easy as it sounds. Uh, the other things you want to do is look at the mushroom from different angles. So if you are um, taking pictures of it um, to ask someone else for an opinion, or maybe you wanna upload it on Facebook because there are Facebook groups for identification and they're really helpful. Um, if you just send them a picture of the cap like this, they're probably not gonna help you very much. So you wanna have lots of angles from the side, from the top. I call this a gill shot. You wanna take a picture of the gills. And um, there are some mushrooms that change color when you touch them, so you want to, um, include that in your picture and smell them. And by the way, you don't have to be afraid of touching mushrooms. So some people think if you touch a mushroom and it's poisonous, you're gonna die. That's not true at all. Um, to get poisoned, you have to ingest a dose and it has to be a lethal dose or a toxic dose. So um, the small amount of mushroom that you're going to have on your skin, at least with the mushrooms we have in North America, none of them can poison you by touch. I think there's one in Europe anyway, in, are far away from us where you can absorb the toxin to the skin, but there's only one species that I know of that that's the case. None of the ones in North America. And then finally, you want to look where you found the mushroom. Was it growing from the soil or was it growing from a rotting log or was it um, growing on the side of a tree? And the type of tree is really um, important because there are a lot of mushrooms that have relationships with trees and if you don't notice what kind of tree it was growing under, then you're missing a really big clue. Now I'm just, I'm not a photographer, um, but since we're really encouraging people in the park to photograph mushrooms, I thought I would just give you some tips of how you can take some nice pictures. So one of them is, you know, don't take a picture from the top, like in this example here, it's not gonna look as, um, amazing or as attractive as when it's taken um, sort of right at the mushroom level. So you're gonna need to lie down on your belly. You might wanna have a piece of plastic or something that you can lie on so you don't get all dirty and something you can lean your camera on as well so it doesn't get wet. And just get down there on the level of the mushroom and take it from that angle. And then if you want some, um, some interest, right, you're gonna have some things in here, they call that framing the shot. So you can have leaves around there. And some people will even, have a little stick leaning on the mushroom or pointing towards the mushroom just to sort of draw your eyes in there. And then if you want to take pictures of the, the gills, you can use the selfie option on your 
on your smartphone and just stick the phone under the mushroom. And then you might be able to get a picture of the gills. Um, so that way, if you're wanting to send it in to someone or you want to keep a little collection for your own use, you're going to have that gill shot that you need. Okay, so um, for myself, I like to keep re things really simple when I'm learning. And one thing that I found that helped me learn mushroom was to sort of try to break them down into a family. And then I would try to sort of, once I knew what family it belonged to, then get an identification. Um, so these are sort of very basic families. Um, most of the mushrooms that we think of the classic have gills, but some of them have um, veins. That would have been an example of um, chanterelles, and I'll show you a picture of a chanterelle shortly. Um, there's a family called Bolites, and they don't have gills. They have kind of a sponge underneath. There's a lot of those in uh, Frontenac Park. Um, so they're really cool. They're actually one of my favorite families. We have ones that don't have gills. They have little pores. So a lot of these are the bracket fungi. Some are crusty, and I mentioned the hedgehogs that have teeth. Um, there's corals and little jelly squishy things, so on and so forth. So that will help you get an idea, I think, if you just sort of try to simple it down that way. So we'll start with polypores because they're really common and they're fun because you'll see them year round. You know, a lot of people say to me, oh, well, come winter, I'm not going to see any mushrooms or any fungi at all. And that's not true at all. You know, if you sort of open your eyes when you're hiking in the woods, and just look at look at trees and look at logs. All of a sudden, by magic, these things start appearing that you might not have noticed. And polypores are one of these ones that are a lot of fun. So one of the features of the polypore mushrooms is that they have pores, right? They have these little holes. I hope you can see that in that photograph. And most of them are forming a shelf, and they usually grow on trees. And this was one of your um, clues for the Frana challenge, the lumpy bracket. And what I've done under the common names is I've put the uh, Latin names. And um, one thing when you're learning mushrooms, unfortunately, is you're gonna have to learn the Latin names because there's a lot of common names in other countries that are inaccurate. So we could use a common name and then you could go to another country and use that name and it's totally a different mushroom. So when you're sort of really getting very serious about mushroom identification, you're gonna have to learn the scientific names. And they're changing them all the time too. So that's a little frustrating because now they're able to do DNA testing on mushrooms and they can say, wow, I thought this was in this group, but actually it's DNA or genetically way more related to that mushroom. And then the name gets changed. Um, so some of us might want to just wait a few years, let the mycologists sort this all out and then we can start memorizing all these fancy names. So one of my favorite polypores is turkey tail. This one is really common. It flushes in the fall. It has these beautiful colors. You know, you can use your imagination and say, yeah, that kind of does look like a turkey tail. And then um, it does have some um, cousins. So this is another variety that's white. In turkey tail underneath will be pure, pure white. And then there's some lookalikes that have different colors and they may look like they have a little bit of a maze underneath. And this is a cool mushroom because it's actually medicinal, so it's been shown to have immune stimulating properties and to have anti-cancer properties. And if you go into the health food store, you might see um, some products that are sold that um, claim to have turkey tail in them. And I say claim because a lot of these health food products, you know, they're not tested. So it's kind of buyer um, beware. But I am a scientist and I'm happy to say that this particular species of mushroom when they've made a claim that it's medicinal, they've actually done some clinical trials and they've shown um, that it does. So clinical trial, for those of you that don't know, is where you have you know, a bunch of subjects that agree to be in a study, or maybe they don't agree if they're animals, and then you divide them into two groups. And one of the group gets a placebo and the other group gets the medicine or whatever thing that you're testing. And then ideally the researcher doesn't know who's in what group. So that's called double blinded, where the researcher doesn't know, the subject doesn't know. And then at the end of the study, they just sort of organize all the data and then they either prove or disprove their hypothesis. So this kind of testing has been done on turkey tail. It's been done on um, women with breast cancer, men with prostate cancer, and in dogs with cancer of the spleen called hemangiosarcoma. And they show that um, when, um, 
this when they ingested turkey tail or when they were you know given turkey tail to eat that it enhanced their response to chemotherapy so it didn't cure them on its own but they had longer survivability so i think that's pretty um pretty cool i'm um I'm a, I'm a veterinarian, so when I see things that are being used to enhance the survivability of dogs with cancer of the spleen, which is really bad news, um, that makes me really excited. And I think what we're finding now is that, you know, there's a lot of stuff in nature that does have antifungal and antibacterial properties. I mean, penicillin's from bread mold, and now I think um, pharma, pharma, uh, uh, pharmacia is um, looking back to nature for new medicines. So fungi have a lot of promise for that. Some other um, really cool polypores are, the one on the right here is a tender polypore. It's also called a horse hoof mushroom. Because if you kind of look at it, you can say, yeah, you know what? It kind of does look like a horse hoof. And it's neat that it, uh, it can be used to start fires. So you can either scrape the bottom and make a little you know, pile of powder. And then if you put a spark to that, it'll start a fire. Or you can actually carry your fire with it. So you know, in prehistoric times, they would have their fire going and then they would put an ember and they would carry it to the next place because starting a fire um, with friction, you know, where they're rolling the stick and trying to get um, spark or not sparks, but trying to get some heat by friction, that's a lot of work. It probably takes an hour to an hour and a half. And uh, if you don't have to do that each and every time, that's pretty handy. So this is a really neat fungus for that. And then the other one that's really neat is the, uh, the birch polypore. And this one's been shown to be medicinal as well as the uh, turkey tail. And then it has the skin on the top that if you were to cut a little rectangle of that skin off, you could use that as a band-aid if you were you know, out in the woods and you had a boo-boo you didn't have a band-aid on you, um, you could sort of make one out of a birch polypore. And interestingly enough, um, Oopsie, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, was found to have both of these um, type of polypores on him. So he was probably using the tinder one to carry his fire around. And um, there's some speculation that maybe he had the birch polypore for its medicinal value, or maybe he didn't have any band-aids. Now, uh, these two are edible um, polypores. This one here on the left is called dryad saddle, or it's often called um, pheasant back. And it was um, recently renamed from polypore squamosis to seriparous squamosis. But I really like the, uh, the common name pheasant back. And if you use your imagination, you can sort of imagine it looks like a bunch of feathers on a pheasant. And um, it smells like watermelon rind, so that's an identifying feature. It, uh, it flushes in the spring, so a lot of people that go morel hunting and don't find anything will say, well, oh, well, I better bring something home. So they bring home some um, dryad saddle. And it's something that um, they harvest when it's really young and tender. Um, most of us see it when it's older and it's just like a piece of wood and totally inedible. And then the other one that's really popular with people that like to forage is this one. Um, chicken of the woods, and it's beautiful. It's with this, well, I mean, look at the photograph. Um, you may have seen them in the woods. It was one of your clues for the front neck challenge as well. It's bright orange on the top and then bright, bright yellow on the bottom. And um, it's called chicken of the woods because it, um, you gotta use your imagination, but it does taste like chicken and it has a lot of protein in it. Um, so it's very cherished by people that uh, hunt mushrooms in the wild. Okay, so now we're talking about the uh, bolete family and boletes have kind of a spongy um, undersurface. So they have tubes um, that they use to disseminate their spores. They don't use gills like other mushrooms, but they do, most of them have caps. So, you know, you might be walking along and think it's gonna be a mushroom with gills and it's not until you look at the bottom of it or you know, do the selfie mode with your camera that you see the, the sponge. Or sometimes I'll just stick my fingers underneath, you know, and just feel if I'm pretty sure it's a bolete and I don't want to take a picture, I don't want to um, pick it, then I'll just sort of give it a feel and you'll feel that sort of spongy texture. And this is the one that is um, kind of the most famous is the king bolete um, because it's a prized edible. And um, we can buy it in the grocery store. You can buy them dried. And I think a lot of um, farmers markets, you know, when they're in seasons, um, people will, will sell these as well. 
So they're kind of like, woo, let me see one of those. And I did see one in Frontenac um, this fall when I was there in, in October. But generally, they're really quite uncommon in, um, in this part of Ontario. They're more common like way up north and uh, in uh, you know, out west and, and in Newfoundland. But just kind of a drag. But anyway, these ones here, though, the painted beliefs, um, are, are quite common, um, not in Southwestern Ontario where I live, but they're really common in the Canadian Shield. And they tend to come out in the late summer or in the fall. And they're very, very distinctive. Um, they've got kind of this fuzzy red surface and they're kind of multicolored when you see them when they're a little older and they open up. So they're sort of mainly red, but there'll be little flecks of yellow on them. And when they're really young, they have a veil that, that sort of co covers the sponge, but once they pop open, the sponge is yellow. Um, so they're really a, a cool um, mushroom. And then this one's very, very common, um, not only in Southwest Ontario, but also in the Canadian Shield. And it's called a granulated bleat. It's in the Suilas family. And most of them are really, really slimy on the caps. And then they have this bright yellow um, spongy material underneath. Um, and there's dozens and dozens of beliefs. So, you know, I'm just sort of showing some more common um, types that are here. And then this picture is just showing they come in a variety of colors. I mean, some of them have red pores, some of them have yellow pores, some of them stain blue when you bruise them. And some of them, you know, are red and they're really fun. And if you're really keen on identifying them, there's this um, web page. Um, called the belief fil filter and then it helps you key it out so instead of having to go through a paper key and I don't know if any of you have done that but you know the, there's a question at the top and yes no and if it's yes you go to question two and if it's no you go to number three and so on and so forth and that's quite time consuming but this filter is just a matter of just clicking on a bunch of things on the web and then it just sort of filters it out um, and so that's a really great um, tool to have if you want to get into identifying beliefs. And they're really challenging, except for some of the real simple ones. So it's really uh, fun to have that available. Okay, I think puffballs are our favorite of a lot of people because they're just super easy, right? So this is what I would consider a beginner mushroom for identifying because there's no lookalike. They're massive. They're these big round things that look like a big soccer ball. Um, they may have a little bit of a stalk, but you know they don't have a stem like your classical mushroom. And when you cut them um, in half, they're pure white in the middle. So there's a giant puffball. This is the pear-shaped puffball. This is a sort of a poisonous co uh, cousin called the um, earthball. These are um, cup fungi, and then these are um, earth stars. Aren't they amazing? And these are stink horns, and I've never seen one. I'm waiting, but um, they come in a variety of um, shapes and some of them have these really cool little nets that open up. So when they wanna shed their spores, this little thing opens up and kind of um, spreads them. Okay, and then um, we have morels, which are sort of one of the um, prize gourmet mushrooms. They come out usually in May in this area and um, you know, people will not usually tell you where they find morels. It's just one of those type of mushrooms. They're really prized. And they have this sort of brain-like um, look or, you know, all these weird little wrinkles. We do have to be careful um, because there are um, poisonous lookalikes called false morels. And the ones, especially that are out west, are... Um, quite poisonous. The uh, substance that makes them poisonous is a chemical that's like jet fuel. And so if someone was to try to cook a false morel and was to inhale these um, chemicals, um, over time it would um, build up in their body and cause liver failure. So um, there, are, there are different varieties of false morels. There are a, a couple that are edible actually, but in general, you're best to say, you know what, they're just all poisonous and uh, just avoid them unless you really know what you're doing. The, ne the next sort of uh, group of mushrooms is the ones that have veins. So they don't really have gills, they have like these little ridges. And I'll just um, show that in more detail when we get to the poisonous mushroom, because there is a poisonous lookalike to the chanterelle. 
And then chanterelles have an amazing cousin called the black trumpet. That was one of your um, challenge clues. And they're also called a horn of plenty. I guess you can use your imagination. And then the, um, the French call them the trumpet of the dead, not because they're poisonous, but because they kind of thought maybe that people who were dead or in their grave were using these mushrooms to communicate with the living. I think that's a little grim. I'd rather just think of them as black trumpets. But anyway, a little trivia for you there. Okay, so now when we're um, talking about guild mushrooms, that's a very large family. And I think we need to pay a lot more attention to the stuff that's going on with the cap with these guys if we want to identify them. So specifically looking at how the gills attach to the stem. If they're not attached to the stem at all, but attaching to the cap itself, we call that free. And then um, some of them will, you know, sort of be attached to the um, cap and stem. They may go downwards, they may be notched, that kind of thing. So um, pay attention to that when you're looking at the gill mushrooms. And then you can sort of start breaking them down into subcategories, just like you have with these loose families. You know, do they have a ring or not? Do they have a vulva or not? Do they have this weird little web? And I'll show you some examples in a minute. Um, those are ways of also sort of breaking them down so we can start to go to the books and try to figure out what exactly we have. So one of the um, easier families of gilled mushrooms are called brittle gills and they're really pretty. They come in a variety of colors. Um, they're pretty common. They tend to come up in the summer and in the fall. So the red ones here, um, and there's a whole variety of red ones, by the way, but um, one of them is called Rusula. That's the family Emetica, because if you were to eat it, it would make you vomit. So it's also nicknamed the, the sickener. Um, and then they can, you know, there's the short stem one. These are really common as well. And these guys, if they get parasitized by another fungus, they'll become lobster mushrooms. Um, so the short stem is not edible, but interestingly enough, when they become parasitized, they, um, they become edible. So the lobster um, mushroom is a prized edible, and it's one of the beginner mushrooms just because it's this lobster orange and very unique looking, and there's really nothing else that um, has that shape or color. So they're a fun family, and the reason they're called brittle gills is if you were to throw them against a tree, not that I'm recommending you do that, but they would just sort of explode into a bunch of pieces. And also when you go to um, break the stem, it'll snap like a piece of chalk. So much, most mushrooms will just kind of crumble or just sort of break apart, but these ones just snap, like clean across. And that's an identifying feature. And then they have a really, really cool cousin called Lactarius that look very similar to the Russellas, but they actually ooze milk and in a variety of colors. So this guy here is an indigo milky. And when it's um, cut, you'll have this bright, bright blue um, milk oozing out, which is really neat. And then we have um, this one here that's called an orange milky and it, it oozes a, well, an orange milk. Um, and then there's some that have um, a white milk or a yellow milk. Um, and they have different smells as well that can be identifying features. Some of them are edible, um, many of them are not, and a couple of them in this family will, will make you sick, um, especially the ones that have this yellow milk. And then we have um, ones that don't have a ring, and an example of that would be honey mushrooms. So um, these are very common in the fall, and they when they grow, like they grow in huge numbers. So that can be an identifying feature. Like you won't just find one or two, there'll be just dozens and dozens on a, on a stump. And sometimes they seem to be growing from the ground, but there's buried wood underneath. So one of the identifying features of a honey mushroom is it's a darker color in the middle. And if you look at it from the side at the cap in the center there, this black, it's actually little tiny hairs. And um, they have white gills and they have um, a white spore print. There is a uh, poisonous lookalike that I'll talk about um, a little bit later. Um, and that one has a brown spore print. And this is not a beginner mushroom for eating. Um, you have to be very careful. And then we have you know, our, um, our button mushrooms that we would find in the grocery store. 
um, and portobello mushrooms. And then, you know, there are mushrooms in the wild that look a lot like these. They're in the agaricus family, so meadow mushrooms and horse mushrooms. And then one called, um, called uh, the sickener as well, because it's, it, it's got this um, yellow staining. So sometimes people call them yellow stainer as well. You see what I mean with all these common names, right? And those ones will, will make you sick if you eat them. So um, I think you're getting the, the, the theme here, right? <laughs> that people that forage have to be extremely careful and knowledgeable. Okay, and so we have um, Amanitas, our family that have a vulva. So they grow from this cup. They start off like a little egg and you can see they look like a puffball, right? So when, when people are um, foraging puffballs, they, they have a rule that it should always be pure, pure white in the middle. You know, if you see a little um, baby mushroom in it, then it's probably an amanita. But anyway, they start off as a little egg or, and then they, they start growing out of the egg or out of the cup. And then when they open up, you know, they have a veil that's under the gills. And then when they open up, um, they'll, they'll have the, uh, the ring or the skirt, that's the veil remnant. And they are, I think, one of the most photogenic mushrooms. They're, they're absolutely gorgeous, but there are a lot of, uh, most of them are poisons. There's a lot of poisonous ones in the family. And this, this is just reminding us of the anatomy. So I just wanted to point out that they have a ring and they, they have a cup. That's an identifying feature of Amanita. And a lot of them have little freckles on them. The next, the next sort of subgrouping of mushrooms is the cortinarius because they have a cortina and a cortina is a web. And if you look here, right, you can see like all these threads that are sort of stuck to the stem. So they were, you know, originally the veil that was on the mushroom and then when it popped open, these little threads remain and you can see some here. So that, that's a clue um, that you have a cortinarius and also the spore prints are usually brown. This is a banded court. This is, I'm not really sure which court that is. Um, anyway, there's dozens in this family. They're, they're pretty cool. And a lot of them are poisonous, as I mentioned. And then we have the ones that are sort of um, nicknamed broadcaps. So some examples would be um, parasols. And I'm just showing there is a false parasol that's poisonous that looks very similar. And then bluets, which were one of your challenge clues would also be in this family. I'm not at all familiar with uh, these mushrooms. And then I just wanted to uh, go back to the clues. So now that you've sort of seen how we talk about families and groups, you can see how you can sort of look at, um, and I didn't really talk about these guys. They're sort of like the opposite of corals. But anyway, you can see that um, it helps you sort of break them down. So you're like, oh yeah, it's in the puffball family. Oh yeah, this is one of the ones that has veins rather than gills and this one has pores no nope, that one has gills okay so i can start trying to hone in on that um this was one of your um clues scarlet hood and they're also called waxy caps and they're called that because if you touch them they feel like a candle they're really waxy and one of the identifying features of waxy caps is that the gills are usually a much lighter um color than the top and almost yellowish so if we go back, sometimes I've had people think they're Russellas. I'm just going to go back to that family. So you look at this guy. Um, I'm not really showing the gills, but if it was in the photograph, you would have seen these sort of very bright white gills as compared to the waxy caps that have those really waxy kind of shiny um, lighter gills. And waxy caps come in uh, red and orange and yellow and white. Um, a lot of colors. And they're like flowers, you know, you'll be walking through the woods and oh, look at all these flowers, but they're mushrooms. Okay, so next we're going to touch on poisonous mushrooms. And I, as I said earlier in the, in the lecture, when you're wanting to identify mushrooms, it's really important that you know the poisonous ones first before you try to learn the edibles. And um, especially the ones that are going to kill you dead. I mean, some of them are going to make you really sick. Um, and not kill you like um, sulfur tufts, but um, there's a lot of ones in here um, that will kill you dead. So you wanna learn those. So these are some of the most lethal mushrooms in the world. Um, the one on the left is a death cap and the one on the right is a destroying angel. So we're gonna see their am amanitas. They have 
the cup, they have the skirt. Um, those are identifying features of this family. Uh, death caps are usually kind of a greenish yellow and then um, the false death cap is more a yellow. And as a rule, the death cap is not really common in Eastern Ontario, it's more in the West, although there have been um, reports of it um, being found out here, but um, they're more likely false death caps. They're poisonous too. So they're just not as deadly as the death cap. And then we have the destroying angel and it's pure white and it's really beautiful. Um, in Southwest Ontario, the destroying angels are pretty common. I've not, um, I've not seen a lot of um, Amanita citrina in, uh, in Southwest Ontario. So they're not as common as the destroying angel. And these guys, like if you were to eat probably a tablespoon, not even like the whole cap, um, you, you need a liver transplant. So they're really bad news. And just while we're talking about poisoning, um, it's always a good idea that if, if, if you are deciding you're getting into the hobby of eating mushrooms or you, have, or you know someone that has, is that um, you always wanna make sure you have, you know, hopefully you're never stupid enough to eat something you can't identify 100%. But you know, if you have friends that are dumb like that, just tell them, make sure that you don't eat all the mushrooms, keep one aside to take to the hospital. <laughs> with you so that they can get an, an ID. Um, but all seriousness, right? Um, we need to be really careful with mushrooms, especially this family. Um, these are ones that don't have as um, lethal, I guess, of a toxin. So um, the toxin that's in um, the death cap and in the destroying angel is uh, the amatoxin. And then we have fly agarics, which are really pretty and um, and they have two different toxins that I've just sort of listed down here. And so those poisons would, um, wouldn't give you liver failure, but they'd make you salivate and you'd have a racing heart and you would be very sick, you'd probably vomit and um, you would hallucinate as well. Um, so um, not really a pleasant thing. And I just sort of made a little point here that um, the person who took this photograph, right, got down nice and low and then this one's not as pretty because it's just taken from the top. So just again, right, just reminding us when we're photographing mushrooms that these, uh, these shots are a lot more appealing than just seeing the cap. Now out, out west, they have the red ones. I nicknamed them the Super Mario mushrooms. These are not, um, I've never seen one in Eastern Ontario. As far as I know, they don't grow out here, but we have this variety out here, which is the uh, Formosa variant. And they tend to be um, yellow and they have these little um, freckles. And then there's a brown one called the panda cap. And when I was in Frontenac in, um, in October, saw a lot, a lot, a lot of these guys. They were really popping out. I think this year, because we had so much rain in the fall, it was a fantastic year for mushrooms. Um, so that's always really exciting. May wasn't so good. There weren't that many morels. It was a dry May. Okay. These are gallerinus. So when I was talking about the honey mushrooms and I said there's a poisonous look-alike, this is it. And one of the identifying features of this is it has this little ring remnant right here. And also the caps and the gills are very, well, they're sort of brown, whereas these guys have more of a, a white gill. These guys have a brown spore print. And sometimes you can see the spore print on the stem. These guys have a white spore print. Um, these um, tend to be, you see the caps are pretty smooth and they, they really like growing on dead logs as do honeys. And so sometimes they'll grow on the same log. So people have to be very careful if they are harvesting honey mushrooms that they go through each mushroom in their basket one by one and make sure they didn't accidentally pick one of these because this mushroom, like just that one little tiny cap and they're quite small, they're only about you know a couple of centimeters at the most in diameter um, and just one cap would, um, would kill you. They're very bad. Okay, um, Cortinarius, most of them are poisonous, not all of them. Um, and then uh, this isn't really probably showing up well in the picture. This one's called a, a fiber cap in wasabi. And then I mentioned earlier that uh, these parasol mushrooms that um, people sometimes like to forage and they grow in the grass have a poisonous look alike. So the real parasol has a white spore print and the false parasol has a green spore print. And the false parasol won't kill you, but it'll make you wish you were dead. 
Now I mentioned earlier that chanterelles have a poisonous look-alike and it's nicknamed a jack-o'-lantern. Um, what makes it different than the um, chanterelles? Chanterelles have veins and jack-o'-lanterns have gills and they're very knife-like. So if you were to try to um, kind of break the gill off of a jack o' lantern and sort of scraping it with your thumbnail, it would come off really easily. Where chanterelles um, don't do that. And then chanterelles as well, they kind of peel like string cheese. So they have a sort of a white stem and that's an identifying feature. They tend to be a lighter color than jacks. Jack o' lanterns are almost like this or really bright orange yellow, where chanterelles are a little bit more subdued. They're more yellow than orange. And um, chanterelles usually, this isn't the best picture, but they usually grow singly, whereas um, jack-o'-lanterns will normally grow in large clumps. Chanterelles grow from the ground, but jack-o'-lanterns grow from decaying wood. Although, like the honeys, you know, you can sometimes have wood buried underground and you think that it's coming from the ground, but um, there's some dead wood in there. And then some other um, poisonous mushrooms that are sometimes um, confused for edibles are things called sulfur tops. So they're cousins of the brick tops. Brick tops kind of have a brick red cap and their uh, poisonous cousins have a yellowish cap. And the gills of both of these are kind of a, a greenish black, not a beginner mushroom. So the, we've sort of touched on um, edible mushrooms and um, you know, I caution people to be to be careful if they do forage and again, a reminder, um, do it ethically and don't, uh, don't do it illegally. So now I'm gonna talk about resources. Um, there are a plethora of mushroom guides out there. Um, and if you're addicted like I am, you just start collecting them. Um, but the ones that I would recommend if you're really interested would be George Barron's book, Mushrooms of Ontario and Eastern Canada. It's a little hard to come by. Um, I have seen it on Amazon, sort of on and off. It, um, it's, it's really good. And he was um, a University of Guelph professor and that's my alumni. So I got to plug him for that too. He's retired now. The other one that's really good, um, Mushrooms of the Northeast is by Maroney and Sturgeon. Um, and if you belong to the MST, which is the Mycological Society of Toronto, they sometimes have Walt come up as a guest when they do their forays and um, and help out with identification. So that's really cool. You can maybe get them to sign your book. And then I really like Baroni. Um, this is not probably so much for the beginner as the intermediate enthusiast. I would say these two books are good for beginners, but wow, this is really um, comprehensive. Um, it's really neat the way he breaks down the mushrooms because he sort of does it um, by spore print grouping as does Baroni. And then this one is, if you're really serious, look how fat it is. He's a, he's a really fun author because he's really funny. So you don't think there's going to be a lot of humor in a mushroom identification book, but um, yeah, David's pretty funny. He's also got a smaller guide here. Um, but this is, you know, if I was going to pick between the two, I would, I would get mushrooms demystified. Okay, and then uh, web pages that I'm going to um, recommend. So um, the, the best YouTube channel, there's a few, but I mean, if you're going to only pick one, you want learn your land, um, with Adam Herodon. He's very knowledgeable. He has a science background. Um, I've never seen or heard him say anything that was false. He's very knowledgeable. Um, this webpage here has a lot of the mushrooms that we would find in Southwestern Ontario and in other areas of Ontario. And then there's a few other web pages. And um, if people are interested in these, maybe you can just email the organizers of this um, presentation and then I can um, send them these links and they can uh, share them with the group. Um, there are a lot of Facebook groups for mushroom identification. And the way that works, you know, you join the group and then if you have a picture and you want an ID and you know now not just take one picture, but like lots of angles, you can upload them to these Facebook groups and there are people who are very knowledgeable there that will suggest an ID. Um, my favorite one is Mushroom Identification Forum. There's another one called Mushroom ID Page, but I just find the forum has, um, I don't know, they just seem to have better experts in there. There's one that's local as well. 
that's pretty good. And then if you really want to start getting specific, there's ones for Ruslas, there's ones for Belize, um, so on and so forth. And I mentioned the MSD, um, not so much that they have, a, they do have a Facebook group, but um, it's a great club if you're really serious about mushroom identification, they do have lectures and they have forays and so on and so forth. And then I want to caution people that, um, unfortunately, there are trolls on Facebook who will on purpose tell you, yeah, that one's edible, go ahead. So um, what you want to do is, if, in my opinion, if you get an ID on, on one of these groups, is go to the books, but also obviously don't eat it, <laughs> just based on one or two people. The way I learned on Facebook is, you know, when you started seeing people uploading pictures and you saw the same picture over and over and over and over again, you know, in May, for example, you'd see a gazillion pictures of, um, of pheasant backs. Um, then after a while, you start to know what a pheasant back looks like. And then you're out walking like, oh my gosh, maybe that's a pheasant back. Maybe I'll pick that one and I'll take a picture myself and upload it. And maybe I'll do that a few times. And then if you get a consistent ID from um, Facebook and you go to your books and you maybe um, do a little Googling and everything seems to agree, then, then and only then can you be confident that that's what you've gotten. Okay, so I think that's the end of my presentation. I'm gonna stop sharing here and all right. Oh. And now we'll just open it up to questions. Thank you, yes. Thank you very much for an excellent talk. There's so much in there. And I'm, I'm really glad we've recorded it too, because I'm I think oh, we'll have to go through that way, several times. Yes. Yeah. Um, I do have it I do have it on Facebook. Um, I did this right. presentation for Five Winds Back Countryside. So um, it, my my Facebook channel is um, Hiker Louise or Louise Hiker, I can't remember. So if you were to put that in and then mushroom identification, you probably find it. But I can send you that link as well, Simon, if people want it. Thank you very or much. We can, can do that the, and share or it. They can watch the recording. <laughs> yes. Oh, thank you. We, we, we'll, uh, yes, be very, very willing, willing to share links because obviously there's a lot of interest in this. Um, and yes, yeah. we'll open up to questions if uh, if that's okay. And um, I guess people can unmute and speak or can write in the chat, whichever works best. I'm so shy. Okay. <laughs> are that or there's, are that or they're fast asleep? <laughs> no, I, I, I think it's, it's been good. Um, I, I, I was expecting some. Oh, so, some... so, so Mar Margaret asks, is there ever a good yes. reason to taste mushrooms? Yeah, that's a good mm -hmm. question, Margaret. And um, there are some mushrooms that um, taste is a clue. And so as long as you spit it out, um, very well and rinse your mouth out that's usually safe i would not recommend doing that with amanitas but the, mm -hmm. the rusulas or the brittle gills um if you taste them and they're really peppery then they're not edible and if you taste them and they're not peppery they are so that's sort of a guide but yeah sometimes taste is used as a clue but very cautiously and you have to spit it out <laughs> thank you um i guess i'll throw a question then um it's, uh, I guess, a, just a general feeling. Last year, when we had the challenge, it was really an excellent year for fungi and mushrooms, and, and that's why we chose that as the theme this year. Because yeah. uh, right from the start, we had an you know, excellent um, crop, as it were. Um, this year, it was a bit thinner, and I don't think we have very many at the start, and it, it improved during the challenge period. I just wondered mm -hmm. um, what is a sort of a predictor of the, the quality of a mushroom uh, outcroppings every year is it is it dependent on weather uh, rain and that kind of thing yeah rain mainly <laughs> mm -hmm. rain and sometimes it's you know it's rain just preceding when you're out so if it's rained the day before or it's rained for a few days before and it's the time of year that those mushrooms are going to pop up then you're going to have a lot of luck so for example if you were to say wow it rained i'm going to go look for morels but it's october you're not going to see morels they only flush in mm -hmm. may so it depends, like a lot of mushrooms have seasonality. So it's sort of a multiple of those things, time of year, but also rain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think September was dry. I can't remember. I know October was fantastic. Ah, thank you. Right. Um, more questions? A lot of people complimenting you on the, uh, 
presentation, we have um, how long is the life of a mushroom? Yeah, I think it, de it depends on the variety. So some of those polypores <laughs> will live for years and years and years, and then other mushrooms may die in a couple of days. So yeah, it, it really depends on the variety. And then what's really cool too is, you know, when we talked about briefly about the mycelium, which is the part underground, I mean, mm -hmm. some of those will live for decades. <laughs> and it's how the trees talk to each other. So if you're really, really into mushrooms, there's something on Netflix right now called, I think it's called Fantastic Fungi or Fabulous Fungi. And uh, they do talk about how fungi are really important for breaking down decomposing trees so that you know mm. things will grow and they talk about how trees communicate through mycelium there's a little bit of um stuff on other uses of mushrooms as well so yeah it's a really fun show oh, thank you thanks and we have a question from paul mckenzie do species tend to recur each year at the same sites yes usually unless <laughs> we do something to hurt their environment um which is why too you know when um when people forage professionally, and I'm not a fan, you know, where people will forage and then sell it to restaurants. The concern is, you know, not that they're picking the mushroom and then it's not gonna come back the next year because the mycelium's there and they usually will. So, you know, if you've got your magic spot for morels that you don't wanna tell anyone, that's because you know it's probably gonna come back there every year. But if you've got, you know, people that are foraging for commercial purposes and they're trampling mindlessly all through the forest and stomping on everything then you know the mushrooms might not come back mm -hmm. but picking them doesn't do it yeah it's just you know or other environmental toxins we're not the only toxin out there <laughs> thank you um another question is um for the friends of Fro all the species of mushrooms featured in the challenge normally found in frontenac yeah yes mm -hmm. yes they were um Thanks. except well except i maybe not black trumpets i mean they are found on the canadian shield so mm -hmm. i'm going to assume they're found in front of but black trumpets um they like beech trees they like a very specific type of oak and they like a certain type of moss so um if you don't have all those you might not have them so I didn't see any in October, but it doesn't mean they're not there. Just the trails I saw, I didn't see any black trumpets. Um, that's a good question. They're really common in the Muskokas. So if people want to forage black trumpets, um, go on Crown Land in the Muskoka area. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Or if you have a friend that's cottage up there, and you're probably going to find them and look under oak trees up there. Great. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, another one from Eileen. She saw a ruffle mushroom in Gatineau Park years ago. Is that the right name? And can you tell us more about them? A ruffle or a russula? Uh, well, it's, she wrote ruffle, R-U-F-F-E-L-E. -E. Oh, I'm not familiar with that one. But, you know, that's the thing with the common names, right? Is that sometimes people will use a common name and uh, it's, a, it's a different name than other people use. All right. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And there's Thanks. two and there's two thousand species of mushrooms in uh, North America. So, um, uh -huh. yeah, it's hard to know them all. <laughs> yes, it's easy. Thank you. Thanks. And from Kathy Cummings, I thought you were supposed to leave one mushroom, not pick the whole lot, so they would flush again. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> uh, an old wives' tale. Yeah, they they will. <laughs> And then, Thanks. and then mushroom, so mushroom pickers too will do things to enhance disseminate. So, so first of all, when a mushroom um, pops open, it's already dropped most of its spores, you know, and the wind picks it up and they blow around. So by the time we come and pick it, it's already disseminated its seed. And then don't forget the mycelium is underground and that's, it's going to, you know, come from the mycelium and then also spread from the, from the spores. Um, so if we pick every single one. It doesn't matter. The one example that might be different would be the giant puffball because, you know, if you pick them all, like they have to explode mm -hmm. to spread. So if they nice. haven't exploded yet, they may not spread. I, although I wouldn't be surprised someone, you know, my colleagues might tell us, no, Louise, they, they grow from my ceiling too. That one, I don't know. Thank you. And um, oh, 
Um, I think just mentioned on this ruffle mushroom, it was very frilly. Was that the help? Oh. Well, there are some that have frilly borders, but yeah, doesn't really. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. And Jen is asking, um, when did you start learning about mushrooms and how did you educate yourself? Oh, yeah, good question. So when I, I, I started learning about mushrooms when I was a little girl, um, they were, I grew up in northern Ontario, so they're pretty common. And so, you know, I, I was interested in them and my parents bought me a mushroom book. And so I knew some of the ones that were in the book, but, you know, didn't really take it seriously. And then when I was in my um, 30s, I had a friend who was Italian who foraged and I was terrified she was going to poison me. <laughs> so some of this learning was just self-protection you know she came home with a giant puff ball oh these are edible and you know so I went on the internet ah! <laughs> and yeah sure enough it was edible and then from there it just sort of um grew so I started off by having books but I found that was frustrating because I'd go for a walk in the woods and I'd see a mushroom and then I'd try to look it up in my book and I'd be I still have no idea so it wasn't until Facebook believe it or not I think Facebook has a lot of evils, but if you, um, if you're, you know, if you have hobbies, I think this is where Facebook is a really good thing. Mm -hmm. So when I started joining these identification groups and either uploading my pictures or just seeing the pictures that other people were posting, it was like learning just started happening. And think right. of it, I mean, um, oh, oh, my computer tried to die. Um, that if, if you've got, you know, 2000 members of a Facebook group and they're all out and you know the the keener ones that are really new start taking pictures and uploading them what is this what is this what is this and because it's May they're all pheasant bags <laughs> then in a couple of weeks you just by it's just repetition right yes, it's, yes. it's repetition and then you just try to learn one or two at a time and then when you know that one then try to learn another couple it'll come so, you know, you start with the real easy ones, and then after that, you can start really progressing. Um, I've also ah. taken courses. There's a, so if anyone lives in Southwest Ontario, there's a fellow in um, Stratford. His business is Pucks Plenty, and he leads um, 4A. So he teaches um, edible wild plants and mushrooms. He's very knowledgeable, and it's like $35. It's really reasonable. And then the MST, um, has forays during mushroom season on the weekends. I don't think there's anyone up the Kingston way. I was looking mm -hmm. um, as far as um, a club and forays, but there is something through Queen's University available to you guys. Um, probably not okay. during COVID, but you can take um, mushroom ID courses through Queen's. So I haven't done yeah. that. Yeah. And the uh, MST has a foray up in the Muskoka's where it's a whole weekend of mushroom picking and then mm -hmm. they hire mycologists to come and do ids so they put all the mushrooms out on tables and tables and then you walk around and you know experts have told you what they are so that's a cool way to you got to see them and touch them to mm -hmm. to learn not just look at pictures and books that's a really good question ah, thank you and um one from jen do you travel to specific parks or regions to try to find specific fungi and can you usually find mushrooms if they are said to be in a certain area? Yeah, so generally, I'm, a, I'm a, actually I'm a hiker. So um, what I do is if, if I'm going for a walk in the woods, because my primary purpose is to go for a hike, I've just developed the habit of just scanning, right? Always looking at the ground and logs and things. And so most of my mm -hmm. mushroom hunting, if you want to call it that, is just where I live. Um, I do occasionally go up to the Muskoka's. Um, I love hiking up there. I mean, and my primary purpose isn't because I want to go mushroom hunting. It's because the woods in, in the Canadian Shield, just like Frontenac Park, are just so different than they are here in southwestern Ontario. To me, it's worth it to drive a couple of miles, even to spend just a day and come all the way home, mm -hmm. just to be surrounded by that beauty. And then um, again, not in Frontenac, but if I'm on Crown Land and the Muskokas, yeah, if I want to harvest black trumpets, I'll drive up to the Muskokas, go to some secret spots that are crown land where we're legally allowed to do stuff like that and I'll, I'll forage. And I have parents that live in Northern Ontario. So if I'm visiting them and I go for a walk in the woods when I'm visiting them, um, there's a lot of chanterelles where they live. So, yeah. Oh, thank you. Thanks. 
Thanks, and a lot of people complimenting on the presentation, so thanks very much. Oh, um, oh Eileen, one more thing. Is that a cauliflower mushroom, this frilly one? Oh, it could be a cauliflower mushroom, yes. It <laughs> looks like, they look like egg noodles, like a clump of egg noodles on the ground. So if that's what she's talking about, it could be, oh, it could be a hen of the woods too. Hen of the woods would look like, like a chicken exploded. <laughs> And there's like a big pile of feathers coming out of the ground. Um, they're a polypore, but they have like these layers. And you can buy those in the grocery store in uh, some of the high-end grocery stores like uh, Farm Boy. They actually sell them. They're called maitake. Um, they can be cultivated and they're a gourmet mushroom. Um, so maybe it's hen of the woods. They're kind of frilly mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I guess one, one, one from me. I, does does every type of fungus, as it were, that has a mycelium produce a, a mushroom, or are there some that just, I guess, disperse their spores in other ways? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think they all have mycelium, but oh, uh, yeah, it, it, I, that's a good question. The sort of the question was: does ev but does everything with mycelium form a form a form a mushroom, or is that, does it have some other? Well, Can mycelium just them... do something else? Well, yeah, I mean, they, the mycelium are sort of helping break down material as well as the mushroom, but um, yeah, I, I think if you've got a mycelium, something's going to be coming out of it, but it may not look like a mushroom, it may yeah. be a crust or maybe slime, like there's slime molds, they're mm -hmm. cool, they're like jelly, they may look little slime balls or, or they may look, I, sometimes if you look at logs and there's all this uh, bright orange stuff on it, that's kind of very flat looking, that may be, that's a fungus, mm -hmm. it's a slime mold. Yeah, so they would have mycelium in the log. All right. I found one once um, that was sort of looking like little bits of fluff sticking out of a twig. The whole oh, twig okay. was covered in it. Um, oh, neat. Uh, it's mysterious. I, I can actually share that if, if that's any help. But it's, it wasn't a mushroom. That's why I'm asking. It looked like this, this tree was infected with something. Um, yeah, it probably, it probably but it wasn't. was, uh, here we go. That's, that's it. I hope I'm sharing that. Oops. Oh, those are aphids. Oh, they're those aphids. Are, it's yeah, not mushrooms are, at all. Okay. No, no, they're a cute <laughs> little insect, and they're they. If you look at them, they're kind of vibrating, and yes. um, I had to Google uh, okay. it, but there's some type of aphid, or they're an insect anyway. Yes. They dance. Okay. They're really cool. Oh, that's. I thought it was some sort of fungus growing out of the brush. Yeah, I can. Um, I can see how they would look like a fungus, yeah. but yeah. This was just anybody familiar the bridge over the uh, swamp at the end of Big Salmon Lake. You turn left and climbing up to the first junction, that was about halfway up. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks. I was sorry. I was just looking at pictures of my take. Oh, while, wow. while you were, Go ahead. You're, you're and talking. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. That was uh, a lot of nice pictures there. Oh, these, uh, whoa, whoa. There's your chicken in the woods. You see yes, it? Yes. That, that, there was a lot of, this was last year, a lot of really wow. spectacular ones. Yes. That's I think uh, probably, yes. That's Another a nice there. picture. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, and someone's uh, smelling uh, a mushroom. Or uh, what not to do? Yes. Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, that's good. That's what you want to do. Um, and then you've got no, a painted, the... just above him, by the way, you've got a Sorry? painted belief. Oh, if you go back down to the guy sniffing. Yeah. That the, one. Um, yeah, yeah. That's a painted belief, but that's oh, bigger. Sorry. Remember, I said they were oh. red and orange yes. when they get bigger, or red and yellow. Yeah, that's a painted belief. Okay. So I guess not not a great Sweet picture. That is. Fuzzy, yeah. yes. But we yes, there was um, some spectacular chicken of the woods last year. Um, slide Lake Loop, mm -hmm. particularly. Um, yeah, yeah, that's an amazing flush. Beautiful. Yeah. So they're a spec, and they're they're one that you know really you shouldn't pick. They're too pretty, right? Yes. Yeah. You want other people yeah. to come by and enjoy that. Mm. All right. And oh, some... oh, he's picking. Oh, no, busted. <laughs> no, he wasn't picking. It, it was found. It was already dispo dispersed. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I advise him not to touch anything. But uh, Oh, yeah, no, he can um, touch. Okay. And yeah. then you've got your, um, yeah, yes. you've got a lot of good pictures there. Yeah. These weird things as well. Um, oh, like yeah, those are, those are in the coral family. Ah, right. Thanks. Yeah. And there's a lot in that family. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes, there's a close up one there. There we are. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. That's sorry, a nice everyone. picture. Wow, you're very oh. good. Oh, thank you. Right. Well, <laughs> sorry. Yes. Um, that was 2008. So it was a while ago, but yes. So.
but I was cheating by using flash there, I think. So this is about mm. flash. Yeah. It's up towards um, site 10. Um, yeah, yeah. Which I yeah. should have used that one for my photography tip of framing. Oh, well, I'm happy to send and share, yes. Yeah. So <laughs> there we go. Yeah. So, so yes, there's a, a few here. I just yeah, pull this up. So, yeah. Okay. And uh, I've got some nice ones. Oh, there's this. I thought this was Black Trumpet, but it's not. No, no, that's an old man of the woods, that black shaggy guy. Ah, right. Okay. The thanks. one that you showed earlier. Okay. That one's a yes. um, black stemmed polypore. Ah, that one. And yes. I only know that because I don't know. I just do. <laughs> thanks, but it, you see my boot there. It's a, it was a huge. Yeah. A huge yeah, they're big. Yeah. yeah, and they'll have a black stem. And they usually come out late summer or in the fall. And there were these pretty ones. Um, yeah, that was one of your log, clues. Actually, yeah, that's scaly foliota. Right. And ah, some of my oh, older nice. books say they're edible, and my newer books say avoid. But they're really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's just south of the uh, junction to site six on the Big Salmon Lake Loop. Mm. Right. Sorry, that's for, for people who know the park. Yeah, so yeah, all right. Nice. Uh, thanks so much. Okay, I'll sharing. But just, so, just uh, in ah, some more, some more questions. Great, thanks. Um, sometimes at the bottom of a tree, you can get some kind of white detergent-looking creamy foam. Is it some kind of mushroom fungi? That might be dog vomit. Oh, fungus. is that oh dog vomit fungus? Oh, not dog vomit fungus. It's a kind um, of a slime um, fungus, and it looks like dog vomit. So I'm gonna. Take a wild guess. Did uh, it look if it looked like a pile of dog vomit? Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> very creative name. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much. Right. Ah, oh, someone said exactly dog oh, vomit. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, that's Kathy Cummings go. again. So <laughs> yes. Thank you. You guys are yeah. challenging me now. <laughs> I gotta put on my thinking cap. Do, 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 do you travel outside of North America when you, the chance arises to uh, explore fungi? Um, not for fungi, but I, I do. I have hiked in uh, the UK and in Switzerland and um, other countries. Not, I'm not going to be for a little while, but uh, yeah, the UK is amazing for mushrooms. Unfortunately, at the time I was there, um, when I saw a lot, you know, the people I was, I didn't know as much as I know now. And I'd be like, what's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? Nobody, nobody knew them. Um, mm. But they get a lot of rain in England, which means a lot of mushrooms yes uh -huh. yes the uk knows how to do rain <laughs> yes uh, thank you and i, I guess I, I know there are some very keen birders in, in actually on the call right now so i just wonder do people are there people who maintain a life list and and, and do go finding the the ultimate mushrooms oh or no, is that, but is it, you know they're not what? taken the same way as <laughs> Yes. Yeah, but why not? That's a fantastic idea. We should get something like that started. Hmm. Make it a new, you know, a new trend. Yeah. Ah, yes. A life list for mushrooms. That would be good. Well, yes. And I'm apologize. I'll, I'll ask one more and say encourage people to to to, to, to send some more in or, or to speak up if you uh, want to unmute and raise a hand. Um, I guess I'd learn. A while ago, that sort of mushroom was an edible thing, and a fungus was the general term for the whole lot. Is that yeah. your understanding? Is that how the words are used? No, not no? really. Okay. I mean, f fungus, you're right, is like kind of like the whole family. So, you know, for example, I don't think I'd call slime mold um, a mushroom, right? Mm -hmm. I would call it a fungus. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of inedible mushrooms that are mushrooms, right? And okay. I think in the UK, they used to say toadstools for the mm -hmm. poisonous ones, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, and there's a lot of old wives tales about edibility too. Like for example, you know, if it turns a spoon, a silver spoon black, I, I don't know if that's edible or not edible, but you know, um, having to do with all red ones are poisonous or the bottom line is there's no rule of thumb. There isn't none. You just uh -huh. got to learn them, unfortunately. Right. Thank you. 
Well then, um, let's see if there are no more questions. I want to thank you very much indeed for a great presentation and thank uh, our uh, participants for um, joining us and, and for some excellent questions. Apologize again for the uh, technical difficulties at the start. Uh, and um, I say, if uh, 